at sige noget. Det er det, hvor den har. Han er først kommet til stand i folketidningen. Han sagde til mig, at jeg nu, hvor den har. Now, for a few, I'm not quite recognizing this heavy face. This might be your first time here. But this is home for this group. We've had the pleasure, the fortune of you all coming year after year after year and hope you will continue to do so because you help us be so much better in telling the stories that you all document. My name is Darrell White. I'm the Director of Cultural Heritage Tourism for the City of Natchez. Up until just a few months ago, I was the Executive Director of this museum. My hand is still in the pocket somewhat, but they keep pulling me to be in other places to do other things. We welcome you all here. We hope that the time that you spend here is not just an experience that you go through and forget about, but that it is something that will stay with you because the more you know, the more you grow. The more you grow, the further you go. You can go. I want you to share something else with others. We need to uh, change those three R's. Coming up in school, they told you the three R's were reading, writing, and arithmetic. I want to change those three R's now. Those three R's now mean reading, retention, Regurgitation. When you study for an exam, what do you do? You read over material. You hope that you retain it. And then you go into the classroom, you sit down and hope you can spit it back out. I say all that to you because it's not enough for you to learn these things if you don't put yourself in a position to spit it back. Let someone else benefit from the knowledge that you have received and never stop learning. You stop learning without growing. So I welcome you to each and every one here. Hope that you find this year's tour as uh, memorable, as fruitful, as productive as you dream for it to be. And if you didn't get it all in one time, come back, as others have come back in years before. In New York, it's called a hero. In Connecticut, it's a grinder. In Pennsylvania, they call it a, a hope. In New Orleans, they call it a homeboy. Or there's a generic names running around the country today, a Subway sandwich. Now my question to you is, how do you eat a Subway sandwich? Do you eat like the cone heads on the old Saturday Night Live where they took the sandwich like this? <laughs> or do you bite at it a little bit at a time? This history, these stories, are to be consumed a bite at a time. And keep eating until you're full. And when you get full, be prepared to share, spit it back out. Okay? Well, welcome. And now I say to a friend, associate, good buddy, We're there. You're here because we're there. Dr. Paul Lockheed. Thank you so much.
much for the girls play. Well, my name is Paul Ortiz. I'm a history professor at the University of Florida. I'm also director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at UF. This is our 11th annual oral history field work trip to Mississippi. And we have done field work in many different towns um, and rural areas and urban areas throughout the state. Um, I believe, uh, Brother White, this is our fifth year in Natchez. And someone asked me beforehand, how do we choose the towns and the areas that we go into in Mississippi every summer? And why do we go to Mississippi uh, every summer? The short answer is this is a state that has made history and has made a signature contribution to not just US history, but to world history. Today, there will be a young person in Paris. There will be a young person in Beijing. There will be a young person in Bremerton, Washington, my hometown, who's reading Richard Wright, like right this moment. Natchez is a town that's known throughout the world for its civil rights movement, its human rights movement, organizations like the Deacons for Self-Defense, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Congress of Racial Equality. So we want to take our students to, to places not only that have made history, but where people care about history. So about five years ago, Kathy Moody, who's sitting at the very front, we made a connection through a mutual friend, and she told me about this incredible institution, the African American History Museum, in this beautiful uh, building. It used to be a downtown post office, right? Correct. It means a lot to me because my wife is a retired letter carrier, and so we're a post office family. And so when I walk here, I, I feel like I'm at home for, for many different reasons. But again, I want to take our students to places where people care about history enough to try to preserve it. Like Brother Boxley, who took us out today to the home of John Weir, and Dr. Simmons and I, and Deborah Hendricks were able to preserve and gather papers from Bill Weir, an amazing civil rights activist in the 19, not just the 1960s, but the 70s, 80s, and really up until the moment he died. Right, Brother Boxley? Mm -hmm. And so that's the short answer for why we're here. But tonight, we're going to hear from three of my colleagues. And I'll introduce those uh, colleagues in just a few minutes. But to let you know, we're here for a couple days. We're going to be doing a day of service. Tomorrow morning, we'll be at Watkins uh, uh, Cemetery. Uh, we, we, all, everyone brought their, their, brought their work gloves. We're going to be with weed eaters and lawnmowers and and picking up sticks and things like that, because we don't want to just take things, we want to like give things. We want to give service and, and help people out. We just came from Montgomery, Alabama. We spent the whole day yesterday at the New Peace and Justice Memorial Museum, uh, where the lynchings of 4,400 African Americans are commemorated, remembered, and we try to learn from that history, not just forget it. We started out at the Southern Poverty Law Center. We interviewed some of the staff of that law center, the incredible civil rights, legal work that they've done, educational work. So incredible that they get bomb threats almost every week. And when you go into the Southern Poverty Law Center building in, in Montgomery, it's bomb proof. It looks like a federal building, like a federal court, court building, because there are so many individuals in this country who are still opposed to the right of us to be able to sit down together, black, white, brown, and otherwise, and to have equality before the law, to have equality in the classroom. And it's important for us to remember how far we've come. We rest on the shoulders of giants, but also we can go backwards. And that's another reason why I believe that this trip is so important. So I just wanted, um, before I turn the panel over, turn it over to the panel. By the way, we have food here, Mr. Green, who deserves our eternal uh, gratitude, has prepared some amazing food for us, so I'm not gonna go on too long, I promise. Um, but again, I wanna acknowledge Kathy Moody, uh, Daryl White, who, who, who started us off, Jeremy Houston, who gave a wonderful tour, uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about that a bit later, uh, Brother Boxley, uh, Mr. Green. And so what we do tonight is we're gonna hear from three amazing people um, I will introduce them in turn. They're going to speak for about five or eight minutes each, I think, around that uh, time period. Yes, Oliver and I, but Dr. Simmons is going to speak for much longer than that okay. because of her experiences being Very a civil good. rights Thank activist you. and professor. Okay, excellent. So I will introduce you in turn, and then we'll turn it over for question and answer. How does that sound? <laughs> 
Um, while we're thinking about it, if you have a cell phone with you, electronic device, go ahead and silence that, put on airplane mode. Um, and I will start by introducing uh, Nicole Yap. Nicole is our trip coordinator for this year. What that meant is that she planned the trip in consultation with me. She worked on everything from hotel reservations to daily schedules to getting people organized to kind of waking them up in the morning to recruiting the team. Uh, she's an amazing young scholar. Uh, Nicole is a recent uh, history honors graduate at the University of Florida, received her bachelor's degree pre-law. She's taking a year to gain more experience, and then she will be matriculating to law school, and it will be an excellent law school. Um, Oliver Toulouse will be the next speaker. Oliver is a coach and coordinator, also a pre-law student, and has worked with the Samuel Proctor Oil History Program and made the trip last year. Yes, sir. Right? And so he's a, he's a, a trip. Uh, 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 just can't get enough of, of Mississippi. Um, and it's been wonderful to work with Oliver on different projects. One of them is we're working on getting an honorary doctorate degree nomination for attorney John Dew. And those of you who don't know that name, John Dew was in this area uh, before Freedom Summer even. Uh, he was in Macomb, he was down in this area taking depositions for people which became part of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Uh, so Oliver's been working um, with us on that project. Dr. Gwendolyn Zohar Simmons uh, will be our final uh, panelist and speaker. Uh, those of you familiar with the history of the Black Freedom Struggle in Mississippi will know her name. She was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee Project Coordinator in Laurel, Mississippi, and, and did an amazing job in, in setting the Freedom School there, uh, was the target of a lot of violence uh, during her tenure in Laurel, um, and later worked the Atlanta Project of SNCC, and today we were looking at the Bill Ware's papers, mm -hmm. and I know it brought back a lot of memories, yeah. Dr. Simmons, for yeah. you. Um, today, um, I'm just incredibly uh, privileged to have her as a colleague. Uh, she is a, a professor in African American Studies and in Religion at UF, uh, and the courses that she teaches are students in Civil Rights History and Religion, uh, Women in Islam, uh, and other topics are amazing courses. And so, without further delay, I will turn over to our panel. Okay. Uh the students asked me to go first, so I will. And I'm um, um, one of uh, all of the folk who were in the van with us yesterday. Know I freaked out when I didn't have my paper uh, tickets for the museum, and I kept saying, "I don't trust these things." And so I had written my talk, and it disappeared on me. So that that reminded me of why. I tend not to trust uh, electronic devices, so uh, I tried to recreate a part of it, but the rest of it uh, I will have to try and uh, share with you from memory. First of all, I'm very pleased to be here. It is my first time in Natchez, and you know, having worked in Laurel, Mississippi for two years, having um, been in Mississippi, um, after the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project on numerous occasions, I have never been to Natchez. And of course, my dearly beloved colleague, uh, William Bill Ware, often spoke of Natchez and I always wanted to visit here. So I'm really pleased to be here tonight and happy to be with the uh, Samuel Proctor Oral History Project students. Um, I um, am happy to always return to Mississippi because this is where I learned to be a community organizer. Uh, but more importantly, it's the place where I learned about the power of an idea whose time has come. Uh, and equally important, I learned about the power of ordinary people who have made up their minds that it is time for a change. And they are willing to sacrifice their time, their energy, and their resources to make that change come about. That's what I learned 
in the state of Mississippi. This is what I saw, this is what I experienced, and it changed my life forever. Um, so I became active in what we call the civil rights movement, but it is in reality the continuation of the African American freedom struggle, struggle that began in Africa when we resisted our captors in our homeland. And it continued in the filthy holes of the ships in which we were chained and shackled and continued in myriad ways when as survivors of these hellish voyages, we were dragged ashore, put on auction blocks and sold like cattle across the South. Uh, and really across the country because it wasn't just in the South. Um, and so these enslaved people continued this freedom struggle in multiple ways. Uh, we ran away, uh, we burned the crops in the fields, uh, we broke the tools, uh, we poisoned the slave masters uh, and their families. And we participated in uprisings, armed rebellions and revolts. And so our freedom struggle is a long one. And so the civil rights movement is just the continuation of this long struggle that continued through the Reconstruction era, the 19th century, as we fought the rise of the Jim Crow system in the South that would institute separate and unequal laws that governed every aspect of our existence. And of course, uh, as an elder in the room, I grew up under the Jim Crow system in Memphis, Tennessee. So I lived those indignities uh, of not having a place to get a decent drink of water or to have a cup of coffee or to have a toilet to go to to relieve myself. Or as we were driving along, I thought about how it was driving when I was a child and there was no place to lay your head uh, unless you had family or friends because you couldn't stay in any hotels or anything. So as we travel through Mississippi, I'm reminded of how it was traveling through Mississippi and Arkansas and Tennessee when I was a girl, it was very different. Um, so the history of the black freedom struggle in the words of James Baldwin was quote, longer, larger, more various, more beautiful and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it, end of quote. And I was reminded of that quote by the title of a new book by Dr. Liz Theo Harris, who we ran into yesterday at the Equal Justice Memorial, lynching memorial as some of us call it, even though that's not its name. And so she was rolling through there as we were sitting on the side and I was able to bring her over and introduce us to her, to everybody in our group. But she has a brand new book out. Some of you may know her name because she wrote The Rebellious Life of Rosa Parks, correcting the history of the life of Rosa Parks. And now she has a new book out called A More Beautiful and Terrible History, The Uses and Misuses of Civil Rights History. Uh, one of the things, as my colleague uh, Paul was saying, that the University of Florida's Samuel Proctor Oral History Project does in its uh, uh, work is to really bring to uh, the forefront the stories of the people who made the movement. Uh, you know, we often just hear about certain people, certainly Rosa Parks being one of them, Dr. King being the most famous of them. And we 
uh, you know, it's the great man and occasionally great woman theory of history. And of course, this is not how history is made. It's certainly not how the civil rights movement was made. It was made up of thousands of ordinary men, women, and children who decided that it was time for a change. Um, Harris, in her preface to the book that's titled, she has a title for her preface, and it's A Dream Diluted and Distorted. The civil rights movement has been distorted. Uh, the work that we were engaged in was to challenge, as Dr. King famously said, quote, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism. And that has somehow been misinterpreted as a movement that marked the exceptionalism and uniqueness of America. It has been used to hold up the power of U.S. democracy and progress to the world. Um, and so in this project, and certainly in my own teaching, I tried to tell the true story of what the movement was about and the suffering and the pain uh, and the death that many underwent in order to make that movement as successful as it was. So this is a brief prologue to a sharing a bit of my own civil rights story uh, as one of the thousands of others that made this movement possible and enabled it to have the successes that it had. I joined the movement as a freshman at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia in 1962. And of course, the civil rights movement was already in high gear. Uh, we had already had the bus boycott in Montgomery and Tallahassee, Florida. Of course, the Supreme Court's Brown v. Board decision had been handed down and the battle over the desegregation of public schools was raging at that time. Uh, the college students in Greensboro, North Carolina had sat in uh, at uh, all white lunch counters at Woolworths and launched the historic sit-in campaigns that had thousands of mostly young people sitting in at lunch counters, movie, movie theaters, museums, libraries, and even churches whose doors had been closed to us because of the color of our skin. Now there was an active student movement already in Atlanta. Uh, it had been started by a number of men and women from Morehouse and Spelman College. Uh, and soon after be, uh, arriving there, I became affiliated with the student movement there in Atlanta. Uh, I also quite accidentally uh, joined a, a church that was um, pastored by Ralph Abernathy. I, I didn't know who Ralph Abernathy was. I did not know that he had been uh, in Montgomery at the time that I joined the church. But a friend of mine said, come go with me to uh, this church that my sister belongs to. And it turned out her sister was Ralph Abernathy's wife. So I get there and I like the church. It's like the church I'd grown up in, a Baptist church. And so after going a couple of times with her, I did join. And by that time I had learned who Abernathy was. So here was a church that was preaching the civil rights movement every Sunday and urging everybody to get involved. SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was about three blocks away from the Atlanta University campus. Uh, and the SNCC uh, staff were always on our campus uh, recruiting us to come to the next demonstration, the next sit-in, et cetera. And, uh, and then in my classroom, Again, I had signed up to take a history class with someone who I didn't know who he was, had no idea, and his name was Stoughton Lind. 
And if you haven't heard of him, uh, please look him up. Uh, but he's a history professor, certainly retired, long retired, but he was also a civil rights activist. And so in the class, he was urging us to get involved in the movement, and he was connecting the movement of that time with this long movement that I began talking about at the beginning of my remarks. And so here for the first time, I was hearing about the struggle that my people had been engaged in uh, since 1619, and I had never learned any of this in school. So this was another motivating factor. So I had this SNCC folk who were my age, who had dropped out of school, who were working full time in the movement. I was hearing it from the pulpit shortly after being there. Dr. King came and preached and I saw him for the first time in the pulpit at West Hunter Street Baptist Church and was greatly moved by what he had to say. And I was getting it in the classroom. So even though I had not gone there with the intention of getting involved in the movement, I was, it was coming at me from three different directions. And basically I thought, oh my God, I have to do this. Uh, during the second year that I was there, I learned that SNCC was planning a Mississippi Freedom Summer Project. And that project was going to recruit uh, 1,000, up to 1,000 college age young people to come into Mississippi to work on three things. They were going to organize something called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. They were going to attempt to get people registered to vote, uh, but they knew that it was unlikely that we would be able to get large numbers of people registered to vote. So therefore, we were also going to have what we called mock registrations that would take place in the church, in barbershops, beauty shops, people's homes even were set up as registration centers. We had registration forms for people to fill out. And the plan was to have thousands of African Americans and others who were not able to register to vote to register with us. And then we were going to take those forms to the Democratic National Convention in August of 1964, present them to show that black people wanted to register to vote. The only reason they weren't was because you could get killed for trying to do it. Many had been killed, others had had their property burned, run off plantations, you name it. And so this was the second leg of the project. The third was to set up freedom schools. And that was what I had planned to do, was to be a freedom school teacher. Uh, Stoughton Lynn, the professor I mentioned, was working on the curriculum for the freedom schools. And I worked with him during my sophomore year in uh, developing that. And in fact, when we drove uh, to, well, before going to Mississippi, we went to uh, an orientation session, which was held in Ohio. And we had a, a car load of the booklets that were going to be the text for the freedom schools all across the state. So um, when I got to Mississippi, first of all, I was assigned to Laurel, Mississippi. Uh, I was afraid. I did not go there as a brave person. Uh, all my life I had heard horror stories about Mississippi. And in fact, the fact that I went caused a rupture with my family because they absolutely did not want me to go and said that if I, in an effort to try to stop me from going, uh, they said, if you go, don't come back. Well, that was, you know, pretty devastating. So I had that plus I'm going somewhere where I'm thinking I could be killed. Uh, the only reason that I thought we might survive was the, most of the volunteers were white young people from the North, the West, and I said, 
certainly those people are not going to kill white people. I mean, they'll kill us, but maybe we'll be protected because there's so many uh, white young people being recruited uh, and their parents are going to be putting pressure on the U.S. government to protect their children. So this was the only reason that I thought I might survive this summer project. Um, as it turned out, we went for the training uh, in uh, Ohio, and there were two sets of trainings, uh, two weeks, I should say, and I had had to be taken on by SNCC as a SNCC um, staff person because once my folks kicked me out, I didn't have any money. And I said to Jim Foreman, who was the executive secretary of SNCC, I said, I'm still trying to come, but I don't have any money of any kind and my folks are not gonna give me a dime. And so he said, we'll put you on payroll. Well, payroll was $10 a week. You might've heard this. And Uncle Sam took taxes out of that. So we got $9.42 a week. That was the SNCC salary. So anyway, because I was now not a volunteer anymore, but actually a SNCC staff person, I was to stay for both weeks of the training. Well, the first week, James Cheney and uh, Andrew Goodman were there. I met them and waved them off when the bus left. Now, Schwerner didn't come. He was already a seasoned worker, having worked in Meridian uh, a year prior to Mississippi Freedom Summer. So Cheney, of course, was from Meridian, but had come up for the training to meet the uh, young people who were being assigned to work in uh, Philadelphia and Meridian. And so anyway, they went off and then the second crew uh, came and I think it was the second day of the second week of trainings that we were all called in to the auditorium. It was unscheduled to have a plenary and everybody on the stage was looking very somber and we were told that Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner had disappeared and that there was no way that they would have disappeared unless they were dead. So here we were about 500 people sitting in this auditorium being told that in the first group of 400 plus three were disappeared and dead. They said, it's no question in our minds that they are alive. And so they said to us, if you want to go home, we will understand. Uh, we knew it was going to be dangerous. We knew the Klan had said they would kill a bunch of us, but we thought maybe they wouldn't, but we now know they're serious. And so if you guys want to go home, you can. Well, I was sitting there saying, I can't even go home. I mean, I gotta go, where else can I go, you know? But nobody left that I'm aware of. So everybody said, no, we're still going. So we continued with the training and then we boarded our buses. And in my case, uh, with two other people, two guys and myself, we were assigned to go to Laurel, Mississippi, but we were told there is no infrastructure set up to receive you in Laurel. So you'll have to go to Hattiesburg and you'll have to drive 30 miles every day from Hattiesburg to Laurel to try and develop an infrastructure. Well, I kept thinking, is it gonna get any worse than this? I mean, oh my God, first of all, they will kill white people, that's number one. Number two, I'm being sent somewhere where there's no infrastructure and I have no idea how to develop such infrastructure. So anyway, we we were we were driving up for I guess we might have been on the second day. We had a list of names. They were NAACP members. 
and we had their names, addresses, and we were told to go and see if they would help us develop the project. So I think it might have been the second or third day I had my list, and on my list was the name of a woman named Eberta Spinks. And I had her address, I went and knocked on her door. The guys were other places knocking on doors. Knocked on this lady's door. She came to the door. She looked like she might have been in her late 50s at that point. And I'm still trying to figure out, how do I ask somebody, will you take me in? You might get killed if you do. Uh, your house may be burned down, but nonetheless, will you take me in so that we can build a movement here? And I still hadn't figured out how you say that, you know? And so I'm standing there kind of stammering like, uh, good morning, uh, my name is uh, Gwen uh, Robinson and I'm, and I'm stumbling and she said, are you one of those freedom riders? And I didn't know if that was good or bad. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, Girl, come in, I've been waiting on you all my life. I was so stunned. I thought, oh my God, really? So I went in, she told me to sit down. She said, what, how, how can I help? I said, well, we're trying to start a project here. We need some place to stay. We need to get names of other people. We need to start an organization. She said, well, you can stay with me. I said, I can. She said, yes. I said, but there are two guys and they're all somewhere knocking on doors across the street. She said, I got a neighbor who will take them in. I said, really? She said, yeah, go get them and tell them that we have housing for you guys. That very day, we went back to Hattiesburg, we got our luggage and we came back. I moved in with Miss Spinks. I stayed with that woman for two years. Uh, she also took in two other women. So three of us uh, lived with her and uh, Mrs. Clayton took in the two young men and that was the beginning of the Laurel Project. And so these two women were the beginning of us having a massive program in Laurel, Mississippi. Uh, Miss Spinks was tireless. She was calling people. Uh, we had 23 volunteers to live in Mississippi. And that lady, not single-handedly, but she was responsible for getting the housing. Um, we needed the churches to open their doors and they were afraid. Some of the ministers didn't want us to have meetings, to set up freedom schools. She got the women organized to force the ministers to open the churches uh, so that we could set up a freedom school. We had a very hard time um, setting up an office because nobody wanted to rent to us. They were afraid that the building would be burned or bombed. So we actually had an office on a back porch and every time it rained, we had to bring in the mimeograph machine and all of the papers and everything. But finally, a man rented us a building that had been uh, boarded up for years. And so the community refurbished this building. Free, you know, we SNCC put the money up for the materials, but the people did all the work and we created uh, an office and had a Freedom School site there. Um, so we organized the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party for the county. Uh, we had the voter registration drive. We had hundreds of people to register in our mock voter registration campaign. And we sent people to uh, uh, the state convention. Um, and I can't tell you how moving it was. Here are people who had never been able to participate in the electoral process. And they went from no participation to massive participation. I mean, they got into uh, party politics like, 
like a duck takes to water. I couldn't believe it. I mean, people were so excited. We took busloads of people up to not uh, to uh, Jackson for the state conventions. Three of our people were picked to go to uh, Atlantic City to be a part of the delegation there. Um, but to not belabor this uh, much longer, what I saw there made me know something I've never forgotten and I don't think I ever will. And that is the power of people when they believe in something when they feel that a time has come for a change uh, and they make a commitment to that change, there's nothing that can stop them. I mean, you know, the Klan did not go away. Uh, that beautiful building that we had refurbished, they firebombed that building and the fire engines, uh, the fire department would not put the fire out uh, we had 5,000 books in there. We had a library, more books in that library than the city of Laurel had in its library. They burned it to the ground. Um, they, you know, every night someone called uh, Mrs. Spinks's home to threaten her and us. So it wasn't as if the danger went away. It didn't. But the people didn't let that stop them. Uh, Mrs. Sphinx would say, as she sat every night with a shotgun across her lap, she said, they may come, but I'm gonna get a couple of them before they come in here. And she sat up every night with a shotgun. Um, and she was not that she was a violent person, but she liked most people say, you know, I'm not going to just let them come up in here and kill us. Um, it was um, something that you don't ever forget. Um, and the power of ordinary people to do extraordinary things is what I saw. People who were um, hadn't finished high school, some were illiterate. Uh, we set, we also set up literacy training. Uh, so it was the experience of my life. It changed my life. And I know that we can do this in this current uh, era where many of the gains that we made during the civil rights movement uh, there are efforts to roll those back, and they are doing it. And we have to organize, educate, mobilize uh, in the way that we did during the Civil Rights Movement to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, you know, we hear the right wing talking about taking our country back. Well, those of us who are progressives, who want uh, justice and freedom for all people, we must take the country and continue the struggle that has been a struggle for hundreds of years, but the one that we call the civil rights struggle, that you still have some of us veterans uh, who lived through it, who witnessed it, who helped to make it happen. We have to build such a movement again. Thank you. Okay, so I'm next. So first and foremost, I want to say how honored I am to be doing this trip again. This trip has had such an impact on my life. Like last year when I participated in the trip, I remember just really thinking about it after like day two and I'm like, this trip just solidified in my mind that I can go to law school and that I need to go to law school and that I'll succeed. 
last December, I was writing my personal statement for law school and I wrote about this trip. That's how profound of an impact that it's had on my life. It basically teaches you about the ordinary stories of everyday people and I'm so grateful that Dr. Ortiz started this because a lot of people don't know about the ordinary people that we interview on this trip. They know about like Martin Luther King Jr., they know about Ralph Abernathy, and you know, all the big leaders of the trip, but it's really important that we always remember all the everyday people who also made the civil rights movement <laughs> possible. I remember learning about the deacons of defense, and I was thinking last year, I was like, wait, in addition to being a history major, I was also an African American studies major, and I never heard of the deacons of defense. And then Dr. Ortiz gave me the opportunity to actually interview a former deacon of defense in Port Gibson. And it's just like the information that I learned from him, being able to participate in that interview with one of the other trip members, it's like you learn so much. And what Mr. White said about the reading, retention and regurgitation, is really important because I took what I learned and when I went back to Gainesville, I told my friends and then also people who were in the African American studies major as well, like about what I learned because it's important that we propel those stories forward. I remember after we interviewed him, we went by this mural that basically commemorated the Port Gibson boycott. And as someone who's an aspiring lawyer, I never learned about that. And it was basically a boycott that lasted for 11 years in the NAACP and the black people in Port Gibson did an economic boycott on the businesses to basically try to get better treatment for the black people in the community. And the businesses eventually took the NAACP to court and the court actually ruled that the black people couldn't, they can't boycott. And then the Mississippi Supreme Court also upheld that ruling and that court case eventually went to the Supreme Court and the court reversed the ruling that the black people can indeed boycott businesses because it's something that's protected. And just in that moment, like reading the marker and looking at the mural and just learning about that, I was just like, man, like all these everyday people that I never learned about that's not in the history books that people don't talk about, it's an experience that I couldn't have gotten if I hadn't come on this trip. And so for like all you people, team members who are new to this trip, I want you to really like take everything in because it's something that you're going to carry on with you for the rest of your life. And I don't think there's another field work, field work trip that's like this. So I'm really grateful for Dr. Ortiz for creating this opportunity in addition to learning about the activists of the past. We also get the opportunity to learn about contemporary activists. I remember one of my favorite interviews other than the one that I did with the former deacon of defense was with a man who was running for alderman and just hearing his story about how he's working to make the lives of the of black people in Vicksburg better it encouraged me to stay on the path that I'm at I'm on to basically be a civil rights activist and go to law school and just know that there's so many people working towards creating a better future for all of us and that it's important for me to stay committed to the work that I want to do so once again, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Ortiz for creating this 11 years ago, because we're in the 11th year of this trip. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, first, uh, before I begin, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Simmons and to Dr. Ortiz. Uh, in the movement, you know, in more formal spaces, you would refer to them as your elders, but colloquially, I refer to them as my OGs. So, uh, without people, <laughs> without people like Dr. Simmons and without people like Dr. Ortiz, both risking life and limb uh, for what they believed in, people like Nicole and myself couldn't do the work that we're doing right now. Uh, so, thank you and thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Uh, I want to harken back before I kind of begin in my presentation with kind of the transformational moment for me on this trip last year. So it was the day of, after the day of service, so we're all understandably physically tired, and it's about two in the morning, and it's myself, Dr. Michael Brandon, and Chad Trevira, uh, who's an activist based at the University of Florida. Uh, and we're all sitting around, we're having my favorite, favorite discussion as an activist is, uh, how can you build political power 
for uh, in marginalized communities. Now, uh, for those of you who may not know Chad or, or Dr. Michael Brandon, Dr. Michael Brandon uh, actually studied under Dr. Ortiz, so he's also another student of, under Dr. Ortiz, and uh, his process of getting his PhD was incredibly grueling. Dr. Ortiz had Dr. Brandon read two books a week on a good week, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, challenged Dr. Brandon to not just write or rewrite and be exceedingly critical of systems of power. Uh, for Chad, uh, immediately after after this trip last year, he uh, was one of the leaders of not just the Nola Ibisita movement, but also uh, the Richard Spencer movement. So I'm in very, very serious company during this conversation. And in that conversation where we all, uh, the three of us have very different perspectives on how we can build political power in marginalized communities. The point is, despite those disagreements, I took that conversation with me for the rest of my life. And Excuse me, that bird was about to come out. Oh. Uh, in that conversation, that conversation since, I've been able to have those discussions regarding how to build political power, not just at the University of Florida, serving on panels for MFP and SPOT, but I've been able to speak at Baylor University, and I'm speaking in Jacksonville next week, and I've been able to speak in South Florida because of conversations like this. I owe a lot of my political identity today to this trip as a whole, and I wanted this trip to be transformative, not just for students this year, in the same way it was transformative for myself, but for years to come. So when Dr. Ortiz approached myself and Nicole to, to lead the trip, uh, I, I got Nicole's a lot better with logistics than I am. And um, I wanted to make sure that students were presented with the opportunity to have those similar discussions. So in formulating the team, and choosing what we were going to be able to do. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ortiz, for encouraging us to go visit the EJI and the SVLC. Uh, I wanted them to have that same kind of experience, and I hope that they've been able to have that kind of experience. Uh, this year, we've also been focused on not only having a diversity in as far as like ethnic and, and racial backgrounds, but also uh, field of study and topics. So we've had students across all disciplines and all research interests and all levels from undergraduate to graduate and including community members uh, to be able to be a part of this this trip because this trip is indicative of how the movement should work. This Systems of power aren't dismantled with just PhDs who, who sit in their office all the time during office hours. Like <laughs> Systems of power are not dismantled during office hours. Uh, nor are they just dismantled by uh, direct action only. It's when different groups of people can come together and understand that uh, thoughtful action, conscientious action, uh, can truly happen when we work together and intersectionally. Uh, so that is why you see the team as made up before y'all today. Uh, we've also uh, decided <laughs> uh, to add a community service component, just like Dr. Ortiz said uh, earlier in his remarks, because we don't believe in just taking from a community. I think it's very easy, especially as historians, because your job is to listen and to excavate for information, but you have to give back to a community. And especially as in a community as so, uh, at least on a national level, as seemingly forgotten as the Mississippi, Mississippi Delta, the opportunity to come back here not only presents us the opportunity to excavate and listen, but also to give. So last year, we engaged in uh, a community cleanup of the cemetery, and uh, we're happy to do so again tomorrow. Uh, we're also in Vicksburg uh, engaged in not just you know community service, but uh, also my favorite, my favorite, and I'm learning a lot from Dr. Ortiz, but maintaining community contacts. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I received a phone call from Ava Murray Ford, and last year I had the opportunity to meet with her and interview with her, and uh, she is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, and I am a. <laughs> No, that's not. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little outside mom. And I'm. Sorry. <laughs> and I. <laughs> I'm a brother of, of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, so immediately off the bat, there was a, a connection that was made. And three weeks ago, she calls me, and she says, I, I, got, I read this email that you wrote me a year ago, and I just wanted to see how you're doing. And I said, boy, would you not believe me? because I'm going to be in Vicksburg again in about three weeks. So this week, we're going to uh, get lunch and catch up. Uh, last year, I also met uh, Brother Dale White, who is uh, obviously the brother in, in, in the movement, but also my fraternity brother. We're part of the same fraternity. Uh, he pledged in the state of Florida, so there's also a connection there. And we met 
as soon as I saw him come around, it was like seeing a long lost cousin. Uh, and I learned the importance of maintaining those community contacts, not just because, you know, we all happen to be members of Greekdom, but seeing how Dr. Ortiz treated everyone that he came across with the same kind of dignity and respect that he would treat the VP of, of Student Affairs at the University of Florida or, or President Fox at the University of Florida. Uh, he treated every person like that. And I felt like uh, in maintaining those connections to be able to do a trip like this with this much uh, academic and community service rigor, you have to be able to maintain those connections. So we wanted to make sure that we're able to not only maintain those connections just on the behalf of Dr. Ortiz, but ourselves as individuals. Uh, <laughs> so uh, for this year, uh, out, just outside the trip, as far as the week. We wanted to make sure that students were able to take those, these experiences and apply them to everyday life. Just like how I've been able to have those opportunities because of the political identity that I've been able to build within this trip, uh, I want students to have the same thing. And I was so delighted, because literally last night when we were debriefing, students were talking about the potential to organize and like just taking 30, it was Maylene, and she was taking, talking about the ability to organize and sit down just for 30 minutes and be able to organize. And I, I like, literally I was about to go up my room and I had to come back down to hear the conversation. Because this is the kind of mindset that we wanted to cultivate, not just amongst students, but community members and everyone were able to come across. That anybody, that even though it might seem that, you know, activism might be something inconvenient. This is integral to everyone's life. Every day, regardless of whether you're a doctor or a teacher or a lawyer or, or whoever you are, that this work is integral to your life and this will change your life for the better. Uh, so uh, I just want to say thank you uh, once again to Nicole for once again being a lot better with logistics than I am. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Ortiz uh, for not only giving me the opportunity for this trip, but for the past two years to really study and learn under his tutelage. He's made me a better person, a better scholar, uh, and hopefully someday a better mentor. And I want to thank Dr. Simmons, uh, A, for being patient with me if I don't respond to emails right away, um, and for being someone who's never, never, uh, never willing to rest on her laurels. Like, like she said, she did uh, Freedom Summer uh, back in the 60s, and here we are 60 years later, and she's still involved with the movement. And I think that's something that we can't take for granted. So thank you, thank you, and thank you. Thank you all. Questions, uh, ideas. Um, wow. Well, I just wanted to come here. I'm sitting here just absorbing and reading several notes here on my paper. Hearing you, beginning with you, and I don't recall your name, however, just listening to the conversation, yes, the uh, instructor, yeah, the entire movement, um, it's so intriguing just to hear you call those names, Rav Kevin, Martin Luther King, I'm sitting here, I'm, I do a lot of reading, however, I can just feel your words as you were going through that entire movement, because I read it, and reading it over again, trying to get detailed information on it. But for you to be able to share what you were doing mm -hmm. in Laurel, Mississippi, mm -hmm. it, it just brings everything full circle to me. And I feel your pain, but I also feel your sense of being that it has made you a better person today because you endured the struggle, you actually went through it. And so to hear you name the overcomer and now you're wanting to tell others about it, it's truly enlightening to my heart. And I too serve as a um, community person who's involved in politics here in the city of Nashville. And to hear you say about voter registration, that's one big thing for me, to bring the community together. And we know that there is power when people come together to work a movement. And I do agree, there is a movement that needs to be done mm -hmm. as soon as possible. So, Absolutely. Thank you. All of you all have done a great job here tonight. It's like my heart to come. Thank you. Felicia Irvin. Felicia Irvin. Any more questions, comments, anything really? Um, thank you for Dr. Simmons. Um, so you mentioned how 
uh, your statement basically for NG said, don't come back if you go. Uh, so what was your inspiration to go? Uh, what, what was your driving um, reason for you to stay, at, especially even after hearing about um, the people who disappeared, mm -hmm. um, what was your reasoning behind, like, I need to stay, I have to stay? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a lot of times those of us who were in the movement talk to one another about it, and I certainly don't think that there was some rational thing. I mean, clearly, as I said, t uh, learning from um, Dr. Stoughton Lynn, but I also had a another wonderful uh, mentor during that early period, Vincent Harding. Uh, this is someone else I urge you guys to look up. Uh, he's written a number of wonderful books, uh, Vincent Harding, uh, but Stoughton Lynn, learning the history uh, played a major role because never had this been hooked up in my mind. First of all, when I was growing up, you know, we had, we were taught uh, lies, ignorance, you know, even to suggest I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, you know, that slaves, quote unquote, slaves were happy. Uh, I had never heard about the struggles, both in Africa, as I mentioned briefly, uh, the revolts on the ships, uh, the slave revolts in this country, as well as, you know, people doing other, other things to fight back. So having that history was, uh, that really was a motivator because it was like, oh my God, you know, all these hundreds of years, there's been this struggle. And now I'm living at a time when there is a major struggle to get us our rights, our human rights, as well as our civil rights. Uh, and it was just like, it's time, you know, and it's already happening. So it wasn't like, you know, I'm a trailblazer here. I mean, you know, the four guys that sat down in the Woolworths, you know, and then after them, hundreds in a few days, it was, 50,000 students. So, you know, I know it's hard to imagine the times. I mean, it was amazing to see what was going on and it was on the nightly news. So every night, you know, you saw people sitting in, you saw people hitting them, yanking them off the stools, pouring hot coffee on their heads, punching them. I mean, and you know, so it made me angry. Um, I certainly had been taught all my life in my home and in my church that it was wrong how we were being treated. So even though my parents, you know, were trying to do all they could to make me not go because they were trying to save my life, I later understood that. But all my life, they had said to me, this is wrong. Segregation is wrong. We were not to be treated this way. I'd heard it all my life in church. This is wrong. This is a sin. So finally, I'm saying, well, if it's wrong, if it's a sin, why don't we stop it? You know, and of course, that was a motivator. So it was emotional. It was um, learning that uh, people have to fight for what is right. And, you know, clearly um, to hear King and Abernathy and uh, John Lewis and Jim Foreman and Julian Bond and um, many others who were uh, closer in age to me, uh, who were putting everything on the line. So you had other people who were doing it so that it wasn't it was a movement, you know, and it's a very different thing than being out there by yourself. And the camaraderie, the, um, and we sang these songs, you know, 
that united us uh, in a way. I don't think we could have even had a movement without the freedom songs. Uh, you know, just the way they buoyed us up. So when we were facing our most uh, dangerous times, we sang the loudest. Uh, I ain't scared of your jails. We were scared, you know, but you sang it anyway. I ain't scared of your jails because I want my freedom. I want my freedom now. And you just shouted it. And you saw how upset it made the cops, the sheriffs. They hated the songs. So we saw, ah, oh, it's getting to them, you know. So let's do it even louder and louder and louder, you know. And that was true. You know, you'd see people being arrested and the paddy wagons would just be rocking because people would be in there singing, I ain't scared of your jails. Uh, freedom, freedom now, you know. It was, um, it was really emotional. It was, uh, it was a physicality to it, you know, that made you feel, I got to do this. It's time. It's time for a change. It's now. As we said, freedom now, you know. Any more questions or comments? Well, we want to thank everyone for coming and listening to us. We really appreciate it. Now it's time to eat, right, Dr. Ortiz? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our host, Mr. Green, um, should we adjourn and, and, and have some fellowship or repast? And continue talking. I'd like yes. to meet the people from the community who are here. Uh, thanking you all for coming, and we look forward to sharing with you over our repast, as we used to say down <laughs> south here. We're going to have a repast. Yeah. <laughs> so let's thank everyone else for time. I'd like to let folks know, since you're doing oral history, this is a book that I published last year called uh, The Private Parts of a Black Man After Returning to Nashville, Mississippi from California. It has three oral interviews in here. One about uh, what we did in California, what I was part of in California, starting in the 1960s until I returned in 1995. And yes, there was a civil rights movement in, uh, in California. Uh, believe it or not, uh, it's, we, we talk about that civil rights movement. Uh, I was part of the Congress for Racial Equality plus an on group called the Nairobi Rifles. And I talk about that uh, in here. And also there's an interview uh, from the University of uh, Mississippi, Southern University or something like that. Yes. Or the University of Southern Mississippi. Uh, Stark that I talk about what I did when I came back home to Natchez in 1995 and started the Equal History uh, Campaign. And uh, equal history means overcoming white people trying to make it look like they've done everything all by themselves. And that's why you were at the Fox of the Road today, because I used the Fox of the Road as a common denominator against all of this history and what happened that's preserved. And the third interview was done by a grad student at LSU, uh, and it talks about the black conscious movement that uh, was part of in the, uh, uh, in the, in the late, 1960, you know, Malcolm X called for a cultural revolution in America, and most of us as young people then uh, heard that call, and you get things like Kwanzaa, uh, African identity, African naming, etc. That took us beyond what was called the civil rights right movement oh, to more to what was called the, the human rights movement. And then we deal with uh, fighting uh, apartheid in, 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 in uh, Southern California. I'm not in Southern California. Southern. It's in a vein of Southern Africa, things like that. So it's a $20 donation if you're interested in that fund. The or what is it, Proctor? If you want to have friend. one or more of these in your collection. Uh, it's that, you that, 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 that you have uh, for all. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.